This is the Homestead Journey Podcast, the podcast dedicated to the pursuit of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. This is episode number 45 of the Homestead Journey Podcast. Welcome, everyone. My name is Brian Wells. I am coming to you from 3B Farm and Homestead here in beautiful upstate New York. And folks, it has been an absolutely beautiful and busy but productive week here on the Homestead. So without further ado, let's jump right into this week's Homestead Happenings and let me bring you up to speed with what we've had going on here on 3B Farm and Homestead. Folks, it is simply that time of the year where the vast majority of our time revolves around our garden. It's that time of the year where all of the hard work that we put in during the spring is really, really starting to pay off. In fact, yesterday on our Instagram and Facebook uh, accounts, and if you don't follow us on Instagram and Facebook, definitely check us out there. I post things throughout the week that will keep you really up to date with what we've got going on here on the homestead. But yesterday I posted a laundry basket full of vegetables that was just absolutely beautiful. The rainbow of colors was just absolutely gorgeous, at least to me. And really, the the pictures did not do it justice at all. But folks, that basket was so heavy, I could, I struggled to lift it. Now, I'm not Mr. Strongman by any stretch of the imagination, but it definitely was very, very heavy. And that wasn't the entirety of the harvest. Um, That was just some of it. But a lot of tomatoes, of course, right now, they're just coming on fast and furious. And uh, so we've been enjoying tomatoes from the garden. We enjoyed some okra this week from the garden. My wife fried up some of it. Uh, I did some cabbage with some bacon. So you take some bacon and you start frying it up on the pan and then you finally chop up some cabbage and throw that in there. And whoo, oh my goodness, folks, that is good eating. And then of course, I am just loving the cherry tomatoes. In fact, Every day as I pull in the driveway on my way home from work, or even really on my way home from anywhere, but particularly on my way home from work at lunch and in the evening, I I drive right by the garden. And so I just pull over, put the truck in park and just dive into the garden looking for cherry tomatoes because they are so absolutely delicious. And I've got a confession to make, folks. I think the Sun Gold Tomato... The Sun Gold Cherry Tomato has catapulted its way up to the top of my list as far as my favorite cherry tomatoes. Now, I absolutely love the chocolate cherries, and the Tiger Striped Romas are really, really good too. But there's just something about those Sun Golds. Oh my goodness, they are so delicious. Now, I also do have the, uh, what are they called? The blue cream cherry tomatoes. I believe that's what they're called. It was one I got from Baker Creek. And uh, honestly, they're just not tomatoey enough for me. Um, They have a tendency to split. And I don't know. They're they're okay. I don't think I will grow them again. Uh, That's sun gold, though. My goodness. It's... It's out of this world. First year growing Sun Gold. I know for a lot of people, it's their their go to cherry tomato, especially as as far as ch- yellow cherries go. But uh, wow, just absolutely amazing. But we've been, been enjoying the abundance of the harvest this week. I picked eggplant, Swiss chard, cucumbers. Uh, I cut some heads of cabbage, uh, and so it's just been. It's just been a great week as far as that goes. Now, the bean arch that we have, I did an arch trellis, and you may have seen that on our Instagram and Facebook pages. And 
that is just really starting to look beautiful as the scarlet runner beans are really just starting to fill that in so nicely and though and then those red flowers are just breathtaking i tried taking some pictures of it but they just didn't even do it justice and so i i didn't bother posting them the the ones from this week that i took just really didn't do the trellis justice. So I may try to get some better pictures and share those. So keep your eyes out for that, but it's just looking absolutely beautiful. And the idea behind that is really because those flowers will call in the pollinators. And quite frankly, I have not seen many pollinators in my garden this year, and that's kind of scary. And so I may add beekeeping to the homestead next year just because I want to get more pollinators around uh, my garden. And I, I can see with my cucumbers how the pollination just isn't there. And so definitely got to up the pollinators. I tried doing it with the the scarlet runner beans and also with marigolds. I've planted marigolds around to try to call in those pollinators. And I just am not seeing them like I have been used to seeing them in the past. And I understand that's a problem that many people are seeing, uh, not just in the United States, but really around the world, that the pollinators are really under pressure. Um, but I I'm going to try to do my part maybe next year by by bringing in some hives of bees. And uh, But anyhow, those that, that scarlet runner beans over that, that arch is just absolutely gorgeous. Obviously, with the abundance of the harvest that we've been achieving, uh, it's been a busy week in, in the kitchen with regards to canning. So I, I canned up more green beans this year. I think I'm close to a little over 60 pints of green beans. Uh, and I've just got to stop because that's way more than we're going to eat this year. Uh, I did a batch of dilly beans this evening. Just pulled them out of the canner before I came in here to record the podcast. Very excited about those because... One of the things that it calls for in the dilly beans is red peppers. Well, I didn't have any red peppers in my garden, but I did have some red mild hot peppers. And so these are going to be a spicy dill bean. Uh, and so I am, I'm excited to see how that turns out. But uh, so I did dill beans, dilly beans tonight. And uh, of course, we've been canning tomatoes like crazy. I learned something this week with regards to canning tomatoes. Now, I have been canning tomatoes, as I've shared with you, for over 10 years. And I always hot water bath my tomatoes, just because you can. Well, this week, as I was preparing my tomatoes, it was getting late, and I had a, a batch going in the hot water bath, but I, I knew that it was, well, I had more than would fit in one round in the hot water bath, and I didn't want to wait because to hot water bath these tomatoes if you raw pack them it takes 85 minutes for quarts and i didn't want to have to wait for another 85 minutes plus the warm-up time and all of that because already at that point i was pushing midnight when these things were going to come out so i grabbed my pressure canner and i pressure canned tomatoes for the first time now when you pressure can raw packed tomatoes it's 25 minutes of processing time. And with this all-American canner that I have, the cycle times are so fast. I, I was just amazed by it. So for me, tomatoes are now going to be pressure canned just because it's so much faster than trying to bring a pot of water up to a boil and then maintain it at that temperature for 85 minutes. Um, that just takes a lot longer than that pressure canner. And so anyhow... Discovered that this week. I don't know why it never crossed my mind that it would be quicker to do it that way. Although, quite frankly, with my old pressure canner, which was my grandparents' um, Miro that had the gasket, the cycle times were a lot longer on that than with my All-American. One of the other things that I tried this week with tomatoes uh, was a different way of peeling them. Now, when you pressure can tomatoes, generally you peel the skin off of them. And in the past, the way that we've always done that is to score them, put them in some boiling water for a few seconds, take them and drop them in cold water, and then take the skin off that way. And they just kind of the skin just kind of peels right off. 
Well, I saw somewhere somebody suggested that you cut the tomatoes in half, put them in the oven under broil, and then take them out and the skin will come right off. And I and I found that I liked that on one hand better because it, it felt to me like the skin came off easier. Uh but it, it felt to me like it took a lot longer to go that route. And and so I think I'm probably going to continue to score and blanch them. But it was it was fun to try something a little bit different. And it did feel to me like the skins did come off easier. It just took a little bit longer time to do it. Although it was nice not having to be on my feet quite so much. So some trade-offs. Uh, but I don't think I'm going to continue to do that. Do it that way. I think the other way was a little bit quicker, even though it's a little bit more work, if that makes any sense whatsoever. <laughs> this week, I also found uh, the, well, I, I guess I experienced firsthand what a lot of people on some of the canning sites have been saying, and that is that canning supplies are in short supply. Now, up to this point, I've been very blessed because I had a good stock of jars, I had a good stock of lids, uh, I had a good stock of pectin. But uh, this week I started running low on jars, uh, and I started running low on pectin, and I ran out of vinegar, and I found, well, that I couldn't find those things. <laughs> I went to several Dollar Generals. I went to my local hardware store. I went to my local um, tractor supply. I went to my local grocery store. And all of them were out of jars. I couldn't find pectin, except for some Serto, I think it was, at my at my local grocery store, um, which I don't really care for. And I think there was only one box of it left. And I couldn't find vinegar anywhere. Uh, except in the small, like, quart size, uh, which if you are doing any kind of canning at any kind of volume is just not, it's not going to work. Um, I mean, it will work, but you, it's just going to have to buy a lot of them to, to, to be able to can. Then I stopped into my local mom and pop grocery store. We have uh, an independent grocery store the next town over, and wouldn't you know, they had a, a great supply of uh, jars and jelly jars, and they had some lids. They didn't have any pectin, uh, and they didn't have any vinegar, but at least they had the jars. So I was very thankful for that. So I was able to get some more pint jars and some jelly jars. My dad also works for Walmart. He was able to get me a couple of flats of jelly jars, and also he was able to get me some white vinegar. But they didn't have any apple cider vinegar at all either. So I think any recipes that I have that call for apple cider vinegar, I'm just going to substitute white vinegar, knowing that the flavor profile is going to be a little bit different. But you got to do what you got to do, and who knows? I may like it better that way. <laughs> At the end of the day, that's the difference. With white vinegar and apple cider vinegar, from a safety perspective, it doesn't really matter which one you use. It's just that obviously there's a difference in play, uh, flavor profile between the apple cider vinegar and the white vinegar. And so uh, I'm going to keep looking for the apple cider vinegar, but if push comes to shove and the recipe calls for apple cider vinegar, then I'm going to substitute the white vinegar and just carry on with life. And who knows? I may like it better. Anyhow, um, this week I also spent a lot of time with the dehydrator. So I'm having a lot of fun experimenting with that. Uh, my mandolin, I think that's how you say it. It's one of those fancy slicer thingies. <laughs> I finally broke down and bought one of those because I figured I was doing all of this slicing and my knife skills are not good to begin with. My knives are duller than a hoe, which is part of the problem. And I just struggle to maintain an edge on a knife. And so I ordered a mandolin that came this week and things were going great using that until Saturday. And then wouldn't you know, on my right hand, I sliced open my index finger. Now, it wasn't that bad of a cut. I threw a band-aid on it. There's a little chunk of skin still hanging off the end of my finger. Not that big of a deal. It could have been a whole lot worse. However, the big problem was, 
is Saturday evening, we had a concert that we were doing at our church, and I happened to play guitar. Now, thankfully, it wasn't my left hand. Um, my right hand, I'm just holding a pick. But there are two songs that we were doing that I finger pick. And uh, so I had to get creative. <laughs> I'm not very good at picking with a pick. Uh, if I've got to pick anything besides just strumming, I use, obviously I do a lot of strumming. Um, but generally I finger pick. And then I had a chunk of my finger taken out on the one day when I really... I couldn't stand to be injured. <laughs> but anyhow, we uh, we made the best of it. Had a great concert. It was a lot of fun. Uh, but this week, dehydrated more tomatoes, uh, more tomato skins, more cherry tomatoes. I experimented with some sweet peppers, poblanos, jalapenos, uh, some hot peppers. I did some cucumbers and sprinkled some ranch dressing on it. I'm not quite sure I really like those, but it was fun to experiment with it. Right now, I've got some green beans going in the dehydrator, so I'm going to see how that works out versus canning them. But uh, really, the big focus has been doing the tomatoes, and I absolutely love the dehydrated cherry tomatoes. It's like it's like a fruity snack, but a healthy fruity snack. <laughs> so anyhow, that's just been a, a lot of fun, and I haven't hardly turned it off in the last week. The dehydrator has just been going and going and going, and uh, hopefully we'll continue to do that as I experiment with a variety of different things. Finally this week, just a bit of an animal update. Our pullets are really starting to, to lay better. Uh, we're now, I think, up to about a half dozen eggs, pullet eggs every day. So uh, trending in the right direction, and it won't be long, and then we'll be able to put our hens in jars. Well, normally I say we send them to freezer camp, but it's not really going to freezer camp this time. They're going to jar camp, but it really doesn't have the same ring as freezer camp, does it? <laughs> Anyhow, we'll be dressing off the hens here in a few weeks, and uh, then uh, hopefully these pullets will work out well for us. And uh, we will continue to get a good production of eggs from that. Like I said, busy week here on the homestead. A lot of stuff going on. But very, very thankful for the abundance that we are starting to achieve. The abundant harvest that we're achieving from our garden. And uh, just very, very thankful for that. All right, let's head on over to this week's Charting the Course. On today's episode, I want to spend some time talking about homesteading and the county fair. You see, this week is going to be a tough week for us. And in fact, really, the last week and a half leading up to today has been very, very difficult for me. And that is because our county fair was supposed to take place this coming week, and it was canceled. And for the last week and a half, Facebook has kept reminding me of all of my memories of fairs past, which is usually a beautiful thing because it just helps build that anticipation as I look forward to the upcoming fair. And yet this week, it's kind of been like salt in a wound, reminding me over and over again that COVID has caused us to have to cancel our county fair. And that's a bummer to me, folks. I absolutely love our fair. In fact, people who know me well know that somewhere about mid-June, I literally start getting giddy with excitement about the upcoming fair, to the point to where I start getting shaky, because <laughs> I love it so much. And, and I'm not just the only one. My son loves it. I think more than maybe I do. I'm not sure if that's possible, but I know he loves it as much as I do. In fact, today, on as we were driving to church, uh, he said to me, he said, Dad, he said, I, I'm just going to miss the fair so much. He says, I love the sights, and I love the sounds, and I love the smells, and I love the food. He said, I just love everything about it. And, and so do I, folks. I just get giddy with excitement when I think about the upcoming fair. And yet we're not having one this year. And that's just a big old bummer. You see, this weekend would have been an extremely busy weekend for us. As we would have been getting together our exhibits and we would have been 
putting together our displays. Uh, we would have been cleaning up animals and getting ready to take them over. Um, because we don't just go to the county fair. We are involved in our county fair. I can't remember how many years it's been. I think it was in, I'm not sure if it was in 2008 or 2009, but it was somewhere in that time frame that we started, or I actually, I started as an exhibitor there, I believe, first. I think I took over some chickens and maybe some canned goods. And then my son became an exhibitor and my wife became an exhibitor. And uh, we've exhibited everything from poultry, uh, chickens and ducks and geese and turkeys. And my son has shown rabbits and his guinea pig. Um, we have shown pigs. We've uh, a couple of years ago, we started taking our American guinea hogs to the fair. Uh, I have taken over vegetables and canned goods, and my son has taken over baked goods and uh, photography, and I just don't, vegetables. We've just put a lot of things into the fair and been exhibitors and just really, really enjoyed it. We absolutely love being a part of our county fair. Actually, last year I was asked to speak on the topic of homesteading at our county fair. You see, we are very, very blessed to live perhaps in the county with the best county fair in all of Fairdom. <laughs> now, maybe that's a bit of an exaggeration. If you think your county fair is better than our county fair, I'd love to hear from you. Brian at thehomesteadjourney.net. Let me know and you and I can kind of duke it out. <laughs> but I love our fair because our fair is one of those fairs that's still very agricultural. It still has its roots in agriculture. It's not become just another glorified carnival. You know, there's a lot of county fairs now that it's just rides, it's midways, it's it's uh, fried food and, and, you know, win a stuffed animal kind of thing. And there's very little anymore to do with agriculture. But our fair is still rooted in that. Our fair is actually the third largest fair in all of New York State. Now, keep in mind, folks, we live in one of those counties that people talk about where we literally have more cows than we have people. And yet over 100,000 people visit our fair every year. It's a huge, huge event. And yet what draws people to it, I'm convinced what draws people to it, is the fact that we still are connected to agriculture here in our county. And it's awesome. Our county fair actually has more, has more cows on the fairgrounds at one time than even the New York State Fair has. Now, the New York State Fair will eventually have more cows as they cycle the breeds through, but at any one given time, we actually have more cows on our fairgrounds than even the New York State Fair. It's just an, it's, it's, it's amazing. There's just barn after barn after barn of cows. We have a huge poultry barn. We have a, a huge a tent that has rabbits and cabbies in it. We have, uh, a swine barn, we have uh, sheep and goats, and uh, it just, I mean, it goes on and on and on. It's absolutely amazing. And I love everything about it. Like I said, I love the sights, the smells, the food. I just, I, I love it. I love it. I love it. And yet this week, it's not happening. And I'm crushed in my spirit. <laughs> now we're going to get over it, but I thought that what I would do today is I would channel all of that frustration into talking to you about homesteading in the county fair and why I think if at all possible, if you have a county fair in your area, that it would be great for you to be involved, to become involved with your county fair. Now, I realize that not every county fair is like our fair, and in fact, there is no county fair that's as good as our county fair. <laughs> but as homesteaders, I really think the county fair is a great place for us to get involved and to really start showing people 
about homesteading and what small scale agricultural can look like and what it can mean and what it can produce. And so today I'm going to just share with you some of the reasons why we're involved in our county fair and why I think you might want to consider getting involved in your fair as well. Number one, if you have kids, it's an awesome, awesome way for your kids to learn responsibility, to receive a, a, a sense of affirmation, to learn more about their animals, and so forth. You see, my son, he does a lot with chickens here on our homestead, but when he goes to exhibit poultry at the fair, there's this packet of information that they give. And in that packet of information, they learn about the technical names of the different parts of the chicken. That's not stuff that I have ever taught him, but he's learned that as, as, as a part of preparing to exhibit poultry at our fair. It's taught him a sense of responsibility, you know, that he has to work on projects and and that, you know, there are certain things that he needs to do if he wants to show uh, and to have exhibits at the fair. And then obviously as he goes there and he exhibits, then he gets that sense of affirmation. They use, I believe it's the Danish system where it, the entries are judged on their merit. So if it's worthy of a blue ribbon, it gets a blue ribbon. If it's not worthy of a blue ribbon, it might get a red ribbon. And if it's not worthy of that, at least gets a white ribbon. And they explain and they take time, at least at our fair, when they're going through the judging process to, to watch the judges interact with the kids and ask them questions and, and teach them. Uh, it's just an absolutely wonderful, wonderful experience. For our homestead, it's also been a great way for us to connect with like-minded people. And in fact, we have been able to make connections with people and form friendships through our county fair. Uh, my buddy Andy that I've talked about before here on the, whole, uh, on, on the podcast, the way that I got in contact with him and his wife was at the fair. Um, they had read about us having American guinea hogs and uh, saw that we were exhibiting them at the fair and they stopped by and we had a great conversation. We also learned last year by way of me giving the talk on homesteading that there were some there was a family at our church that was doing the homesteading thing and I didn't know it. I don't know as they knew that we were doing it. And uh, now their family actually listens to this podcast. So, uh, hello, Townsends. Big shout out to you guys. Um, but we were able to connect with like-minded people through the county fair. It's a great way to introduce other people to this lifestyle, or at least components of the lifestyle. So maybe demonstrating, you know, that canning is still actually a thing. Although, as I said in the Homestead Happening segment, I've discovered that a lot of people are discovering canning, which is leading to a shortage of supplies. And I'm hoping that next year that bodes well for our canning category because the numbers have been steadily dropping over the last decade uh, as older people stopped canning or stopped entering their um, their canned goods into into the fair, and as the older generation passes on, uh, I was a bit of a, an odd duck, an anomaly. You know, somebody of my age doing this was a bit a bit odd. Now, what's awesome is there's people younger than me that are really getting into this, and so I'm really hoping and excited about next year's uh, exhibits, and really hoping that we're going to see a great increase in the number of canned goods that we see in the handmade homegrown building, but it's a great way to introduce people to at least, if it's not the entirety of the homesteading lifestyle, it's things like canning and gardening and uh, maybe needlework or whatever it is that you do, crafts uh, and baked goods. Each fair is going to be a little bit different. Uh, our fair has a section on woodworking. So a lot of things like that that are components of this lifestyle you have an opportunity to showcase that. And maybe, who knows, maybe you'll be invited to give a talk at your county fair about homesteading and what it means and why it's important. 
It's also a great way to receive validation that what you're doing is important, that what you're doing is is valuable, that what you're doing is is good. It's an encouragement when you put in a can good and it and it wins a ribbon. It, it's it's good when you put in vegetables and uh, and you win a ribbon. And, and even if not, even if you don't win a ribbon, the fact that you're participating and that there's you're you're showing other people that hey, growing food is a good thing, preserving food is a good thing. There's a sense of validation in my mind, at least to me, that comes along with that. It's also a heck of a lot of fun. <laughs> for, for a number of years, I was after my mom and dad to enter things into the fair. My mom and dad can, as I've shared with you before, they can. They, they preserve a lot of things. Um, my dad has honeybees. He has a beautiful, beautiful garden every year. And so for years, I was after them to put things into the fair. My mom makes beautiful quilts. And for years, they kind of resisted. And then a couple of years ago, my mom started putting in canned goods. And it's become this really great friendly competition between the two of us. Now, we don't always have entries in the same categories. But when we do and we go head to head, it's always fun to figure out who's got the bragging rights. And that's really what it is. It's bragging rights for that year. Now, there's been times when my mom's beat me. It hasn't happened very often. <laughs> no, but there's been times when my mom's beat me, and there's been times when I beat my mom. And then, you know, my dad, like I said, I was trying to get him to, to put stuff in, and he, oh, Brian, you know, everybody else's stuff is so much better than mine, and you know, blah, 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 blah. And a couple of years ago, he finally broke down. He put in some honey, and wouldn't you know, bam, right out of the gate, he wins a purple ribbon. Now, purple ribbon is best in show. You got blue ribbons, which is like the best in the category. And then purple ribbons is like the best of the best. And right out of the gate, that jerk wins a blue, a purple ribbon. <laughs> I was so bitter because I'd been doing this for like almost 10 years. And up to that point, I hadn't won a purple ribbon. Now, last year, I did win a purple ribbon with my green beans. And so I got that monkey off my back. And I think I, I won a purple ribbon with um, some chickens. So, uh, you know, all right, I got that monkey off my back. But my dad, right out of the gate, what a jerk face knot. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> no, but it was awesome. I, it was great to see that. And it goes back to the validation that what he's doing is important and he's doing it well. And then he put it, he started putting it in vegetables. And so he and I, again, like me and my mom, we kind of go head to head in the canned good stuff. Me and my dad, we're going head to head in the vegetables. And it's all about bragging rights. And it's a lot of fun. There's a, another friend of mine from church, uh, Ken, who, uh, you know, he put in some, um, I think it was sun gold cherry tomatoes. And uh, my chocolate cherry tomatoes beat his sun gold tomatoes. Actually, I've won the blue ribbon in cherry tomatoes two years in a row. I was hoping for three years in a row this year. And that's a tough category to get a ribbon in. I'll tell you right now, it's a tough category because everybody grows cherry tomatoes. But those chocolate cherries have brought home the blue ribbon two years in a row. And this year is going to be the third year in a row. Ugh, COVID, you make me so mad. <laughs> but uh, it, it's just, and so Ken calls me Garden Boy. And uh, so this year, in fact, uh, last Sunday, he came up to me at church and he said, oh, Garden Boy, he said, uh, I, had, I had a great crop of vegetables this year and I was going to take you down. Uh, you know, it, it's just great. It's, it's, it's just a lot of, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun to have that. Now, some people can take it way too seriously. And there are some people at our fair that do. But if you keep it light, you keep it fun, and, and just keep things in proper perspective, it can be an absolute blast and a hoot. And you know what? If my dad beats me, I'm so proud of him. And if my mom beats me, I'm so proud of her. And when I beat them, they're proud of me. And it's just an absolute, it's just a lot of fun. Last year, they actually had an open class in the swine barn for the first time. It used to be that the swine barn was youth only. 
And last year they allowed adults to exhibit. And so I exhibited a pig for the first time and it was an absolute train wreck. It looked like the demolition derby out there of pigs just running around because I didn't know what I was doing. I'm not a professional pig shower, a professional pig wrangler. Uh, but it was an absolute blast, and I got to do that with my son. And he actually exhibited better than I did, so he beat me. So he's got the bragging rights, but it was just an absolute blast. It was so much fun to do that together. And so the county fair can just absolutely be a great source of fun. Finally, the county fair can be a great way for you to advertise if you are selling meat or vegetables or those kinds of things. Now, it's going to depend from fair to fair on how much they allow you to do that. But by being there and exhibiting and at least getting your farm name out, if you are doing those kinds of things of selling meat and selling vegetables and so on and so forth, participating at the county fair can simply be a great way for you to advertise your goods and services to other people and let them know that you exist, that they're aware that you have a presence. And who knows, you may be able to grow your homestead income simply by being a part of the county fair. Do you participate in your county fair? Do you like going to the county fair? What's your favorite thing about your county fair? I'd love to hear from you. Share some of your stories with me. You can either do that by replying on our Facebook uh, posts, our Instagram posts, or by sending me an email, brian at thehomesteadjourney.net. I'd love to hear your stories. And I really strongly encourage you, if you haven't been participating in your county fair, now most places, either county fairs are already over if they were having them, or they've been canceled across the United States. But start planning for next year. Depending on how your fair does it, if you can get a hold of the fair book, the entry book, start looking at the ways that you can enter into the fair. And then next year, you can plan your garden accordingly. You can can your things accordingly. You can prep your animals accordingly. Or maybe you can set things so that, you know, the birth of a particular animal falls at the most optimum time so that you can win a blue ribbon at the county fair. <laughs> Folks, I absolutely love our county fair. I'm going to miss it. It's it's going to leave a big hole in my heart this week. And that is no exaggeration. And there are so many people, so many friends of mine that uh, are feeling that way this week. It's, it's a, a great source of sadness for us. But uh, I'm looking forward to 2021. And uh, I'm going to knock the socks off my mom and dad, and uh, maybe, who knows, I'll beat my son exhibiting pigs uh, in the swine barn, and it'll just be an absolute great time. All right, that's it for this episode of the Homestead Journey podcast. If you'd like to support the show, you can do so in a number of different ways. First of all, you can support the show by leaving us a review or a thumbs up on your favorite podcast player. Share the show with friends and family, people that you think might be interested in what we're doing here. We also do have on our website, thehomesteadjourney.net, we have a shop set up that's just affiliate links with Amazon. So if you go to thehomesteadjourney.net slash shop, I have a list of equipment that we use and books that I recommend. If you buy through our link, we receive a small commission for every sale. But the only thing I'm posting up there, folks, are things that I use here on the homestead and that I recommend. If I don't use it and like it, it ain't going up there. <laughs> All right, folks, the music on this episode, as always, has been provided by audionautics.com. So a big shout out to them. And until next time, everybody, keep up the good work.